Good morning and welcome to the podcast. It's late December, two days after the solstice, two days before Christmas Day. It's quite cold, about six degrees, no wind and overcast. Quite a damp day. I'm always at a little bit of a loss where to go over Christmas and New Year. I never really want to travel too far. So today, for my walk, I've headed into Leeds to a place that's played a part in most of my life, really. Temple News and Park on the outskirts of the city. It's a large country estate that was established in Elizabethan Tudor times and was in private hands until the 1920s. The estate comprises farmland, parkland and ornamental gardens. Since it came into the city council's ownership, it's gained other public amenities, a golf course, running track, football pitches and a cafe and a shop. It is a very popular park for the people of Leeds. Probably I should try and explain the geography of the place. It might help to imagine the park as a triangle with the bottom part of the triangle bordering the city when I was growing up in the 1960s. The other two sides of the triangle would have been against open countryside, putting the park firmly on the edge of Leeds. In fact, there's a a road that runs along its eastern boundary called Bullerthorpe Lane, and I remember seeing the Leeds city boundary as you came up Bullerthorpe Lane from the Wakefield side. Things have changed uh, a little bit in the ensuing 40 or 50 years and the city with housing and shops and offices now encroaches onto much of the left-hand side of the triangle and the entire right-hand side of the triangle, although still against open countryside, has a six-lane motorway running its entire length. The A1-M1 link road that does what it says links the A1 with the M1. I was unsure where to walk today at the park. You literally could spend all day. The entire perimeter would probably take two and a half hours and there are shorter walks through woodland and parkland. I've brought my new dog with me that I talked about in the last podcast and the place where I got him from, they were unsure whether he liked to walk very far saying he had a tendency to sit down and refuse to go any further after 50 yards. I've parked today in one of the main car parks near the lodge gates at the Whitkirk end of the park. There are two red brick lodge houses that date from when when the Temple Newsome house was built and a gateway that presumably was one of the main access points into the grounds. I have no set plan as to where I'm going to go and today is probably just going to be a amble with the dog and me reminiscing about previous trips of which there have been hundreds if not thousands. So far, the walk seems to be dog-led. Rather bizarrely, there have been paths, although this is the first time he's ever been with me, that he doesn't want to go down. And there's an awful lot of sniffing going on. Again, probably due to the fact that he's never been here in his life before. But it's a big test. He doesn't know it. But I do spend an awful lot of my time outdoors. Some company I have always found is nice, whether it's human Okay, nine. So if he passes today with flying colours, I may well have a, a new friend to go walking with in 2023. We left the car park, which is about half a mile from the house. You can see it over Parkland. And we're headed down through an area called Oak and Elm Wood that now has one of these places where people can come and swing from trees, go on zip wires and walk on pathways high in the wood. From there we went to the walled gardens that in summer is filled with perennials and roses. Just negotiating a very big fallen down tree. Absolutely no trouble for the dog. Yes, and the walled garden in summer is beautiful in the process of being cleared and tidied and the yew edges trimmed today. In the walled garden is some long, maybe 100 to 200 yards long, white glass houses, which is where I have some of my earliest photographs. We lived locally when I was a baby, and my parents would bring me up here in my pram. And in the glass houses, against the back wall, are some red geraniums. 
pelargoniums to give them their proper name and they're still there almost 60 years later and back then with 35 millimeter film the slides were all the rage and we have slides that my dad took of me being pushed through the greenhouses I'm guessing the love of gardening had to come from somewhere just at the back of there is a field that contains a medieval lost village I believe the medieval village was from the 1300s, 1400s and it's at the end of a lane I think it's called Colton Road, Colton Lane that used to be a small village in the 1980s a lot of housing was built so this is where the city reaches Temple Newsom on this side We're now in an area called Hartford Springs, which is a mixed deciduous plantation, lots of new young trees, and in previous years a big problem with rhododendrons invading the woodland. I'm on the edge of the woodland and on my left there are open fields and open pasture. The woodland is as you would expect. Rhododendrons form part of the ornamental gardens and Temple Newsom is famous for its display of azaleas and rhododendrons in spring. Unfortunately, like in a lot of wet temperate climates where they've been introduced, they have been very invasive and the first part of this woodland does have a lot. I'm now further uphill turned away from the fields and I'm walking parallel to Bullerthorpe Lane and just beyond that the motorway I've always made the effort to reach this section of woodland as it has some beautiful mature beech trees and oak trees that I've convinced myself of been here since the park was first planted and even on a day like today it's very dramatic with the almost infinite network of branches silhouetted against the dark grey sky podcasting with a dog not something I've ever done especially a dog you've only had for two weeks <laughs> but so far so good Running from Bullerthorpe Lane almost all the way to the house is a broad avenue that you can look back from the house down it and vice versa you could look from this end towards the house. I'm just reaching that track. I could turn right here and walk directly back to the house but I'll go the way I've gone many times before, straight over it and into the woods beyond. When we were children living in East Leeds and came to Temple Newsom in the summer on our bicycles this used to be the limit of, uh, of our adventures there's a gate by Bullerthorpe Lane and if we made it to the gate we knew it was time to turn round and head off back no phone, no food, very little money and out wandering the north of England for hour upon hour from an age that probably nowadays would get your parents reported to social services just like when I was much younger I've reached Bullerthorpe Lane and I'm turning round and heading back through the wood towards the house this section of woodland is known as Avenue Wood even though it's probably the noisiest with the two roads nearby it's always been one of my favourite areas I zigzag now through the woods till I reach the gardens and then walk up in front of the house it's just got a lot darker in the last few minutes and that fine drizzly rain seems to be setting in we're at the opposite side of the woods now the, the southern side uh, and again to the left is a big area of pasture and fields maybe half a mile before you reach the, the motorway this is known as the Shrogs and I believe was in the 1960s a, a large open cast coal mine uh, and is all reclaimed the fields and newly planted woodland in the park itself are two lots of lakes and ponds that were laid out when it was built uh, in this woodland there, I think there are three lakes fed by a, a, a spring at the Colton side uh, and they come down and dissect the, the woods in half as the water flows away towards the, the river air just pausing because there's a, a beautiful oak tree I 
the rain now much more persistent than it was before. The park and gardens were laid out by a very famous English gardener called Lancelot Capability Brown. And if you imagine an English stately home with lakes and ponds and gardens, it's that kind of environment. I may have said before that walking in woodland when it rains is probably one of my favourite things to do, but not when there are no leaves on the trees. It's much nicer when you have that thick green canopy. A squirrel climbing up a, a, a gnarled old tree, 50 feet tall, 3 or 4 feet across in diameter, stripped of its bark, almost looking like a giant totem pole with big knots and gnarls going up it. I've now come out at the bottom of, I think it must be two pools in the woodland. To my right, about 50 yards away, is the avenue that runs down to the house. And it forms a dam for the lake at the other side and an overflow sluice running through the middle. It's made of stone and has got two columns at each end. I believe it is actually a grade two listed structure that again was part of the grand design for, for the garden. One of the bad reports we had about this dog was that he wouldn't go in water. Not that that's a bad report, but uh, wouldn't go in above his toes. And of course I'll never force him. But this is a, an area that two of my dogs previously, I couldn't get out of it once they went in. Two Labradors, 30 years apart, both with exactly the same trait, that they absolutely loved water. This chap doesn't seem fussed. In fact, I think he might have an inkling already that we're heading back because he seems to put a bit of a spring in his step. I think there must be a, a large iron content in the ground round here because noticing there where the mud at the side of the lake is all that bright orange colour. And there are a couple of places where there are streams that also run the orange of iron. Just coming through the undergrowth now, out onto the avenue. Looking to my right over the little dam with its pillars and low wall back towards Bullethorpe Plain. And to my left the path goes uphill. A stone path six feet wide with a grass verge at either side and then trees and then woodland beyond that. We're now heading back towards the house. Walking along the avenue and coming over the crest of the hill, the view back is fabulous as the avenue dips and then rises again in the distance towards Bullethorpe Plain. Here's a lovely spot. As you reach the brow of the hill it dips sharply away and takes you down to the, the lakes and gardens. And you can see clearly across the canopy of the trees bare as they are today, or some just with a few brown leaves still hanging on. And then in the far distance as the hill rises up again from the lakes, there's Temple Newsom House on the horizon, maybe about a mile away. And today, it's almost invisible in the mist and cloud. Here to my right is a bank of fern, brown, and a, another test for my new dog coming up on the left. Uh, as there is a field of cows, the, the Temple Newsom now has a, a rare breeds farm that's another visitor attraction. Keep cows and sheep and goats. Now I don't know if he's ever seen cattle, and if he has, what his reaction might be. This avenue when I was a child coming from this point all the way down to the lakes and gardens was, was just grass and it was a lovely place to walk. But unfortunately the park is much busier and has been used for so many different things, events and festivals that it's now basically a broad mud or concrete farm track. Not sure what they are, but they're mostly all white, with a huge bull surrounded by females and, and young calves. They're a fine looking animal, well, most of them have horns. I can report that the dog didn't take any notice of them at all. I've reached the bottom of the avenue and gone right into a lovely area of beech woodland that leads up to another listed building at the site and a couple of my favourite trees. One in particular that must be two or three hundred year old beech tree and uh, the listed building is a folly 
a small stone Greek temple facing the house, facing the parkland. It's fenced off now with three metre high security fencing as I think it was getting badly vandalised and it's been left in poor state repair for many, many years now. Again, the dog's never been here in his life before. It seems to know where he's going. The area in front of the temple was heavily wooded and a few years ago uh, they cleared a lot of the trees to try and restore the view to how it was. The little temple. This temple is positioned to catch the eye when looking east from the house. Other features from Brown's landscape include the Sphinx gates on the carriage drive that once swept round from the north lodges up to the main courtyard entrance. The ha-ha and carefully placed clumps of trees. Lancelot Capable of Tib Brown was a popular landscape designer employed by many landowners with large estates. He was improving Lord Weymouth's estate at Longleat when he received his invitation from Charles Ingram, later 9th Viscount Irwin, to landscape Temple Newsom. Capability was employed to remodel Temple Newsom Park in 1762. The work took eight years to complete at a cost of over £2,000. I've zigzagged my way down through the woodland from the little temple and I've reached the, the bottom of three lakes that form part of the, of the gardens. Here yeah, the formal part of the park starts. It's deserted. I thought there'd be more people here. There's broad grassland and, and clumps of trees planted on the hills going up to the left towards the house. And to my right is the lower lake, beyond that the middle lake and then a small upper lake. Looking towards the lakes to the left is a small arboretum, many different trees planted. And beyond that the rhododendron and azalea walks. The rhododendron and azaleas with pathways through them. There's no wind today and the rain's falling straight down, creating thousands of little concentric circles on the lake. From the lake is a, a small dam and overflow and then about four steps down to a little ford, which the dog jumped over. Clearly doesn't want to get his feet wet. Come on, pal. As I cross the grass in front of the house towards three clumps of trees, the full splendour of this stately home comes into view. It's made of red brick with stone around the window frames and it's built on three sides with a courtyard in front and a clock tower and a weather vane on the main middle section. So it's right and slightly lower are what I think were the stables. There now how's the cafe and shop. And again to the right of that is Home Farm, which has always been part of the estate and does have some very old farm buildings. Looking back now to the east, I can see the temple on the hillside with the greens and browns of, of some trees. The rest bare. Struggling to see the avenue, it seems to be shrouded in mist. And then to the right, the area that was formerly a coal mine. Now fields and newly planted areas of woodland. To the west, the house, the grassland still rising in front of me. I do have a favourite bench not far from here. And so far, because of the rain and the cold, I haven't stopped for a break. I'm starting to feel a little weary and I'm nearly back at the car so I think it's time to take 10 minutes to drink coffee and eat cake. It is nearly Christmas after all. I did want to sit here, drink my coffee, have my mince pie and then wax lyrical about the amazing times I've spent at Temple Newsom. But it's pretty much pouring with rain now and there's a wind that wasn't here an hour ago, blowing straight at me from the northeast. This is a lovely spot though, the, there's a clump of trees to the left and through that the house in front of me, the stables, to the right of that the farm, to the right of that the, the hollow where the lakes are, 
the Arboretum, the Rhododendrons. And then the woods and open fields yeah, going towards the motorway. The times I've spent here have been many and frequent. From school we used to do cross country runs here, we used to come on school trips here. My parents brought me, I had adventures here with friends. In later life I worked in the area, attended concerts, some unmemorable ones that were dreadful events that should never have been given permission, but some were, were okay. I remember one in the early 80s. We used to have a, a folk festival and it was a very pleasant afternoon sat drinking beer, listening to folk bands and when there was a steam fair with steam engines and fairground rides that was also fun and then at Christmas it's a place that you always gravitate to with your family for walks on Boxing Day and even today there are people here but the weather is now dire so it's time to head back and get warm and have a cup of tea. I'm now standing in front of the house and looking back I can now see the avenue heading east. Welcome to the house, the magnificent Tudor Jacobean country house dates back to the 1600s and is steeped in history and grandeur. It is described as the Hampton Court of the North as it too has its royal connections as the birthplace of the notorious Lord Darnley, the infamous husband of Mary Queen of Scots. The house is set within 1500 acres of a capability brown landscape of stunning rolling parkland, formal gardens and intimate lake sides. It was Sir Arthur Ingram who opened up the house to the surrounding land in the 1620s. His alterations left other marks you can see today including bricked up windows and rainwater pipes decorated with his family crest, a cockerel. Sir Arthur was also responsible for the inscription that runs along the top of the house, probably the largest of its kind. The letters were originally made from carved stone, but were replaced with iron in 1788. Turn around and you will see the East Avenue, which has stretched into the distance since the early 18th century. All glory and praise be given to God, the Father, the Son, and Holy Ghost. On high, peace on earth, goodwill towards men, honour, true allegiance to our gracious King, loving affection amongst his subjects. Health and plenty be within this house. Heading back to the car park now, I've crossed the front of the house and I'm heading towards the west, again across open fields alongside an avenue of trees. Just by the side of the road here is, I think, one of the oldest trees in the park. I think I once looked and I checked in my books one summer, it's a sweet chestnut tree, and I think it's about 400, maybe 500 years old, which is really quite staggering, given that an entire city has grown up around it. Taking photos of a 400-year-old tree in the rain with your phone with a dog wrapping the lead around your legs soaked to the skin in the December rain. What a fantastic three hours I've just spent. Walking across the field in the rain with the new dog that looks as lively now as when we set off. It seems a good place to end the podcast. Hope you've enjoyed it. Tell your friends about it. Share it on your social media and if you can do join me next time. But until then Cheerio.